The next presentation is by me. Um, my name is Curtis Young. I'm the Van Wert County Extension Educator. And my title there, Deciding to Use or Not to Use GE or GMO Crops, Is It a Good Thing or a Bad Thing? And I'll start out this uh, presentation with a, a statement that I am not anti-GE GMO. Um, I don't have a problem with the consumption uh, or the, uh, of any products that are made with GM, GMOs or crops that are fed to livestock. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, just like uh, when Paul began his discussion, he asked what happens to that genetic material that is consumed. Um, it's digested like any other genetic material that is consumed. I don't have a problem with groups. Um, I do have a problem with uh, groups that try to falsely demonize GE and GMO uh, crops. Um, there are people that are worried about dogs being fed food made with GMOs. Now, really, uh, my biggest concern is keeping my dogs out of the cat's litter box and cleaning all the Tootsie Rolls out of there. Maybe I should be worried about what the cat's eating um, so that the dogs aren't getting GMO through that route. Um, but I, I think it's kind of ridiculous that we're um, concerned to that point. Now, I love my dogs. I hate anything to happen to them. Um, but I have little to no concern about them eating GMO-produced dog foods. Now, th this has been taken to a ludicrous level, in my opinion, with a vodka-producing company finding it necessary to say that they make their vodka with non-GMO grain. Come on, really? They're worried about unknown um, risks about consuming a GMO and in totally ignoring the sclerosis of the liver from consuming the alcohol. Now, that's going way too far, in my opinion, to even justify the concern for the GMO. I am an integrated pest management uh, specialist by training, and I look at these GMO crops as tools. They are something that we can utilize to make our crop production better, more efficient, and less damaging to the environment as long as we use them appropriately. I don't look them at them as being necessities. I don't look at them as we absolutely have to plant a GMO crop to get a crop. That's not the way that we should be utilizing these very valuable tools. We should be incorporating them into an appropriate pest management plan and not abusing them and not using them so frequently that we lose their value before we ever get to a point there that we absolutely need the tool that they are providing. So we have to ask, can we live without them? And the answer is, yes, we can live without GMO crops. We just go back to how we produce crops before. We have to relearn how to use our herbicides appropriately. We'd have to relearn how to scout our crops to react to a true pest problem being present in the crop or not being there in the crop. So um, there's nothing magical about the genetically engineered crops um, that we couldn't do without them if for some reason they weren't no longer available to us. As with any tool, if we don't use them appropriately or if we abuse them to the point that they're worn out before we ever get an opportunity to truly see their value, then we're going to lose out uh, for having developed them in the, pl in the first place. Um, if they are not needed, why are we wasting these tools? And I'll, I'll explain where I'm coming from with that here in a little bit. Um, and if we are not careful enough with them, now we will run out of their value out before we ever really get to where we need them on a regular basis. So what kind of protections do we get with our genetically engineered crops? Um, well, we, we're very well versed in that by now. Um, there's insect protection, there's um, uh, herbicide protection. Now, he, this is one of the places that I, I think the public doesn't fully understand 
what they're what we are doing with these genetically engineered crops. For example, the Roundup Ready crops, the glyphosate um, resistant crops. Some people think when they hear that that the corn plant is producing glyphosate as an herbicide. They don't understand that the crop has just been made resistant to the effects of glyphosate when it is sprayed over top of the crop. And so they have it in their mind that the, these corn plants or soybean plants are manufacturing glyphosate in their own tissues and then you're consuming that glyphosate along with the, the, the crop plant as it's introduced into the food system. So that's one error that has to be somewhat cleared up with the public. Now, on the other hand, if you're talking about the BT crops, there the crops are manufacturing the pesticide within the tissues of the plant. Wow, you're feeding us pesticides. Oh my God, we're eating pesticides. Uh, it, it, what they don't comprehend or realize is that BT product is just a protein. And what happens to that prote protein when we consume that protein? We look at it as any other protein. Our digestive system simply digests it and tears it apart, just like eating steak. Now, steak is primarily protein, and when our digestive system has that introduced in it, it breaks it down into the component parts, and we absorb pieces of it, not the product in its entirety. So it depends on what is selected as to what kind of protection we get with these GE crops. Um, initially, the first crop that was put on the market uh, was the BT corn borer corn uh, uh, varieties or hybrids. And it was targeting one specific insect, being the European corn borer. And in 1996, it was the introduction of this crop into the market. And it just happened to be so fortuitous for the company to have introduced it to that, that year because we had one of the biggest outbreaks of European corn borer that I had ever seen in my career occur that year. And as a result of it, the value of that tool just skyrocketed. Now, here we have protection against this monstrous insect that is tearing apart our corn production. And then after that, you know, that's when the herbicide-resistant crops started being introduced into the market, the Roundup Ready soybean first, and then that was followed by the Roundup Ready corn. Also, there was Liberty Leak resistance in there. Um, what we weren't initially told in the development of these crops is that Liberty Link gene was connected right in with that Roundup Ready gene because that was the marker gene to be able to select out those plants that didn't get the gene introduced into them. But it was the Roundup Ready that was marketed first. And then afterwards, Liberty Link began to be marketed. Um, later on, we got more insect protection incorporated into some of the crops, above ground insects, um, mostly Lepidopterans, and then below ground insects, and we'll uh, see the list of them there. Some of this was uh, resistance to it. Some of it was just um, uh, uh, tolerance of the pests that are in that list there. And then the below ground gene for the corn root room corn rootworm. And of course, some of these are some of the most important insect pests of corn production in the United States. Uh, use level of the traits, uh, of course, uh, depends on the area of the United States that you're looking at. Uh, here you see by 2009, we were already up to 85% of our corn acres were genetically modified corn, primarily the uh, European corn borer genetically modified corn. Um, and it's gotten higher in many other states uh, throughout the United States. Now, Peter told us we're only up to 86% of our corn hybrids being genetically modified as of last year. Um, we seem to be holding back a little bit more than some of the other states in terms of total adoption of genetically engineered corn plants. Almost all of the acres um, that were genetically modified for European corn borer were almost also um, glyphosate resistant. Our, our soybeans 
um, they're probably up to 90, 95% uh, you know, glyphosate resistant. Um, or Liberty Link resistant, or now Dicamba resistant. Um, so you know, we're seeing more of these genes introduced into the market. Most, uh, uh, we go on from there, a high proportion of our uh, corn is now also corn rootworm resistant. Now, uh, this is where I start getting a little bit more antsy about how many traits are simply being put together and you buy all of it or none of it. And, and the reason that I'm a little bit more iffy about having all of the traits stacked together is that now we're using that tool all the time for everything. And in some cases, it may not be totally needed. And in other cases, it might be needed. And then the, the other concern I have there is we're constantly bombarding less than economically important populations with a mode of action. And whenever we start using the same mode of action against either a weed or a disease or an insect over and over, we're just running a science research project out in the field to find resistance. When we may not really need to be doing that, especially for corn rootworm. And we'll look at some examples as we go along here. Evolution of resistance management. Of course, the companies that were in, installing these genes into the corn plants, and when it comes to insect resistance, realize that the potential for selecting resistance is absolutely out there. Um, initially, when the first European corn borer hybrids were brought out, you had to plant 20% of your s same amount of acreage with the gene in it to non-genetically engineered uh, crops very nearby, if not just uh, uh, immediately adjacent. As time went on, that started to be backed off a little bit. Um, instead of a block uh, within the same field, it, it may have only been adjacent fields. Strips within the same field were acceptable. And now we're down to refuge in a bag. That could be as little as 5% of susceptible plants to whatever insect the genetically engineered crop was combating. Some of this was the reason for um, refuge in the bag was looking at um, the distributions of the insects from field to field. Sometimes they don't fly very far away from where they emerge out of the soil. And if you don't have that refuge plant very nearby, they may never see them. And so that's part of the, the reasoning for putting it into the bag. The other part was just simply convenience. You didn't have to think about it. It was already there. All right, so um, the other things that we need to ask ourselves, what do we get by using these traded hybrids all the time? Uh, they, to answer that question is very difficult because we don't, may not be getting anything from some of these traits that are being planted out in the field, or we may simply be getting minimal benefit from them being planted out in the field. How much of this is simply um, risk aversion? It's an insurance policy. I sleep better at night. My, uh, my management is already out there in the field. Unfortunately, there's also some faulty logic out there. And what I mean by that is um, if you plant the crop out there in the field and you don't have any problem, then the trait must have worked. Well, it may not necessarily have been any problem out there to begin with. Now, why does the faulty logic cause me problems in terms of justifying planting these genetically engineered crops. Well, it costs money to plant these genetically engineered crops, and we're trying to protect profitability as much as we are protecting the crop growing in the field. And if we're losing profits by buying expensive seed that we don't really need, then we're losing money unnecessarily. Getting back to that concept that I'm an integrated pest management specialist, I scout the fields and look when the problem arises and then react to it rather than just immediately using the tool and not necessarily needing the tool. Uh, so um, the, the other problems that we have definitely encountered have been with our herbicide resistant genetically engineered crops. Initially, they were incredibly successful. 
Glyphosate programs were inexpensive. They were easy to do. Initially, it was just soybeans. Okay, we're only using it one crop, and then we're going to a different crop the next year and having an entirely different um, number of herbicides that we're using. So that was good. Then came along glyphosate-resistant corn. In our corn-soybean rotations, now we're down to one herbicide program for both crops. And now we don't have a break from that one mode of action, and now we're back to that very rapid selection program for whatever resistance exists out there in the field. And as a result of that, now we have glyphosate-resistant ragweeds, common ragweed, giant ragweed, common, uh, Roundup-resistant mare's tail, Roundup-resistant common lamb's quarter, and a big one, common water hemp. Um, is really coming on strong in northwest Ohio. Uh, Palmer amaranth, fortunately, we have had limited populations of that particular weed in Ohio, but it is showing up much more regularly in Ohio. But go down south where they had Roundup-ready corn, Roundup-ready soybean, Roundup-ready cotton, Palmer amaranth is eating the south alive. They have uh, such huge resistant populations of Palmer amaranth um, that many soybean production fields are simply abandoned because they can't control the weed population with hardly anything they do short of plowing it under and starting over. Now that Palmer amaranth down south, unfortunately, is migrating up north. And so whenever Palmer amaranth gets here in great numbers, it's already glyphosate resistant, as well as resistant to a number of other active ingredients. Um, barnyard grass is Roundup resistant, giant foxtail Roundup resistant, Johnson grass Roundup resistant. And so once all of these weeds populations were susceptible for the most part to Roundup or glyphosate. Um, but because we use Roundup, Roundup, Roundup year after year after year, we have pulled what little resistance was in the background to the forefront and now we're paying the piper for doing so. Uh, and so what do we do the, to deal with that? Well, we're going to other active ingredients like glufosinate. Liberty, um, or dicamba. You know, dicamba is an old chemical. It's been around for decades. And um, we're bringing it back into the mainstream because we don't have choices of much of anything else to deal with these already glyphosate-resistant soybeans. Now, here's the situation, and I won't tell you where this particular field is. Um, this is a soybean field that the individual that was planting this field found that Roundup, Roundup soybean uh, program so easy to do that he decided to do it every year, year after year after year. And when I was called into onto this situation, you can see there's just these huge patches of giant ragweed coming up in this field. Um, the first thing I said is, you can't plant Roundup ready soybeans ever again. And the guy planted corn one year, and the next year he went right back to Roundup Ready Soybean. And the mess in that field has just gotten worse and worse and worse. So we've abused that tool to the point that it's absolutely non-functional in that field there. Here you can see Roundup Ready corn and the, the giant ragweeds bigger than the corn plants are in that field. Um, so it's uh, not only in soybeans, but it's also in corn. Palmer amaranth, uh, here you can see uh, the pickup truck in the background. Those are all Palmer amaranth plants in the foreground. There's a female plant that's going to seed. Each one of those female plants can produce a million to a million and a half seeds apiece. So instantaneous resistant populations uh, because we can't use Roundup to control it. This is water hemp. Um, and for the past several years, we have done weed surveys in the fall in soybean fields. 
And uh, for most of the time, it was just common ragweed, giant ragweed, maybe some mare's tail showing up in these surveys. This water hemp, which is another pigweed, um, is coming out of the background uh, with a vengeance. And I've seen some soybean fields that were covered from end to end with water hemp because it too now is glyphosate resistant. Uh, and again, because we abuse that tool of Roundup Ready soybean, Roundup Ready corn, year after year after year, we've got ourselves backed up against a wall because we've selected the resistant populations out of the background. We can still use glufosinate or Liberty Link soybeans. But what we have to do is learn the lesson that we unfortunately learned with Roundup that we can't just now come in with that glufosinate resistant soybean and plant it year after year after year and just use Liberty as the primary herbicide. We'll be right back to where we are now with glyphosate. Dicamet resistant soybeans, you know, likewise, uh, if we uh, use that or abuse it the same way that we did Roundup, we'll be in the same predicament. Now, um, I said earlier, I don't think planting these uh, genetically engineered crops are a necessity. With the dicamba resistant soybeans, it may be a necessity that everybody plants that resistant soybean. Not so that everybody can use dicamba, it's for those that want to protect their soybean crop from their neighbor's dicamba use. Yes, the, the new dicamba formulations are supposed to be resistant to volatilization and drifting, but in the past couple of years what we've witnessed out in the field is it gets up and runs all over the place. And uh, as a result of that, it's almost a necessity to plant those dicamba resistant soybeans just to protect yourself against drift. And there, um, it's not that they're using the dicamba on their own fields, it's just protection against the neighbor's fields. And we've seen a lot of this cupping of soybeans. And unfortunately, by the time we see that, there's no evidence of exactly what caused that. Um, is, is it really all that important that one doesn't use the insect protections? Well, um, there are things that could go wrong. Yes, we do still have a number of insect pests out there that we should be concerned with. Um, now, the problem with insect pests is they're not absolutely predictable of what we're going to experience every year, uh, except for a few, such as potato leaf hopper and alfalfa. If you grow alfalfa, I guarantee you, you're going to have potato leaf hopper problems. You just need to scout for it and determine when you need to manage it. Uh, continuous corn, you have a very high probability of having corn rootworm problems if you don't have uh, protection against the rootworm populations. In continuous, first year corn, well, that's a little bit different story. No-till uh, corn into heavy weed cover, I can almost guarantee you can have black cutworm in those types of fields because the adult moths, when they fly into the state, are going to be attracted to that green material. Seed maggot, if you turn manure into the soil or green weeds into the soil right before planting, I can almost guarantee you, you will have seed maggot problems. Uh, but all these other um, insect pr problems for uh, the, the uh, corn crop, you know, they're a little bit more unpredictable. Is European corn borer still a problem in the United States? The answer is absolutely, it is. Um, when was the last time we had a major problem with the European corn borer? Actually, it was just a couple of years ago. Yeah, 1996 was the big year. But in 2013, if you had non-GMO corn planted, I saw a lot of European corn borer move in in that year. Popcorn, sweet corn, a number of these are not BT corns, so they are very susceptible. They are reservoirs for European corn borer and other crops. Um, so here we have sweet corn with the European corn borer in it but it also gets into a number of vegetable crops, such as peppers. Um, it's a, a very good uh, source of food for the European corn borer. So, long time pest, it has not disappeared, even though some people think 
Uh, again, this was in 2013 or 14. Uh, went, walked into a number of fields and saw European corn borer damage all over the place. Um, very healthy caterpillars. Uh, they were in the ear shanks in the following spring. Well, uh, this is an interesting, this is a popcorn field. And popcorn does not have any gene to protect it against the European corn borer. So all that breakage across that field. I could probably count the number of plants that weren't broken on one hand uh, due to the European corn borer pressure. And every plant that I looked at, there was European corn borer. Now in the background in this particular image, that is genetically engineered uh, field corn that had to resistant to European corn borer and the corn, the popcorn field right in front of it was absolutely susceptible and just was mowed down by it. So yeah, there is reason to use the uh, BT corn occasionally. Not constantly, but occasionally. Now we have to monitor for the number of caterpillars that overwinter from one year to the next. And then when we get to the European corn, uh, to the corn rootworm, uh, again, uh, w what we're seeing is potential problems arising with at least some of the uh, BT traits. Uh, the Cry 3BB. 3BB1, which was the original Monsanto gene for protection of Euro against European corn borer, uh, <laughs> corn rootworm, excuse me. All of that whole appearance in that upper end of the field um, was protected by that gene, and yet the lodging in that corn was horrible. Resistance has developed in the corn rootworm out to the Midwest because they plant a lot more continuous corn and they were planting the same gene year after year after year into those fields selected for resistance. And that resistance seems to be extending to some of the other genes as well. Um, do we have the same concerns in Ohio? Well, it depends on where we're looking at in Ohio. If we're looking around a dairy, there's a lot of continuous corn production. Um, and if we use the same BT over and over, we could be looking for resistance. And uh, we also have to remember that first year biotype. Uh, first year corn rootworm, uh, that moves from uh, corn into soybeans. That could be a, a problem if we're selecting for resistance in that population as well. Uh, other things that can go wrong, application errors. You know, when we start thinking that every field has uh, Roundup Ready corn or Roundup Ready soybean in it, uh, if it doesn't and is not labeled correctly, it could be treated inappropriately. And then drift issues, as we mentioned before. Take home messages, traded corn hybrids are tools for management and we have to use them judiciously, otherwise we may lose them before we really need them. Um, they are neither good nor bad. They are just a tool. And we just have to um, be careful with them and not abuse them. Uh, with, as with any pesticide, we need to rotate modes of action to avoid the development of resistance. Um, deciding when to use them, you know, we need to be informed, we need to scout, we need to um, know when they're, they're most appropriate to use. Cost-benefit analysis, they do cost more than non-GMO. Uh, if we're looking for profitability, we need to make sure we protect that. Is it a necessity? What kind of history do we have with these pest problems and local pest pressure? Risk aversion is partially why we've adopted these so very vehemently and used them. And it was easy. Uh, the protection was there in the field. But if we're not careful, we may lose that protection to the future. And with that, my time's up already. Um, Lee Beers is our next and last speaker of the day. Uh, Lee is the Trumbull County uh, um, Extension Educator. And he is going to address issues that can arise when you decide to plant a specialty crop when nobody else has planted it in that state before.